And good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a very interesting show. We, well, we've had an interesting show so far with Jack Splain. I want to thank him for coming in. But now we're going to transition uh, to an interview with former District Attorney Paul Walsh uh, of Bristol County and the New Bedford Highway serial killer case, the still uncharged highway case. We have been discussing that here because Maureen Boyle, formerly of the Standard Times, has recently written a book called Shallow Graves. We had her in the studio, and it, it, it has uh, reignited the conversation about the highway killer case, what went on, uh, whether it ever be solved. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the book with Paul, because he's read it uh, twice, and want to ha- get his thoughts on it, get his thoughts on the case. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about you know Paul's understanding of the case, who, of course, it was one of the four district attorneys now who have had a part of the case. It started out with Ron Pina, then Paul, then Sam Sutter, and uh, today it is still uncharged and unsolved, so uh, District Attorney uh, Tom Quinn has the case. So Paul was the second of four district attorneys that, that have handled this, this case. Good morning, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Chris. Thank you. Nice uh, to be here. So you read the book twice, Maureen Boyle's book. You, you took it to Ireland with you. I did. And uh, what, what were your thoughts on the book? Um, I thought it was very, very well done. Uh, the attention to detail was remarkable. Um, the, the journalistic skill that she applied to basically a novel, uh, it's, it's hard to call it a novel, but um, uh, the attention to detail I thought was remarkable. It brought you back to not just the things that happened, but the culture of right. that time, um, which is easy to forget. You forget about how bad Weld Square was back Talk in Talk about days. that a little bit, Paul. Um, yeah, I announced my candidacy back in, uh, geez, around St. Patrick's Day in uh, 1990, um, and we did it down in uh, Weld Square because it was just the one of the reasons why I was running. Things were out of control, and Weld Square was the prime example of that, and it was visual. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, when I did the news conference down there, we set up on the street corner, and there were four or five drunks behind me, and they were, you know, yelling stuff and um, selling drugs and all that. It we forget how bad it was at that period of time. Now, I I say that, and not to cast aspersions on just the New Bedford culture, because I had been uh, an assistant district attorney in Boston, and at that time prosecuted hundreds of cases that came from the combat zone. Right. Um, And if anyone, like I did, I used to like to go down to Madison Square Garden for basketball tournaments. Right. Times Square was... uh, Disaster. The culture seemed to be allowing these things, looking the other way and saying, ah, well, you know, it's just... uh, you know, victimless crime, that type of thing. But at some point, um, that victimless crime became uh, plenty of victims. And I think the, our society had to take a stand. Uh, I don't think there was any, you know, line in the sand, any mm-hmm. red line that we crossed. But I think there was some point, and Weld Square being an example of that, that society just said, we can't take any more of this. Something has to be done. Unfortunately for us in the greater New Bedford area, that sort of red line, if you want to call it that, was the highway killings. Right, right. No, I remember when we first started discussing this, you said that that was something that you reflected back on. Just You'd forgotten that. And I had, too, really, because I was younger. I was a kid, but, but it was everywhere, it seemed, at least at Wells Square. And there were other pockets of the city that had problems. And I, I think to this day, I think most of that, nothing's cleaned up completely, but... The city's a, a lot different than it was. A lot different. I mean, there were areas you, could, you just knew. Uh, everybody knew them. The police knew them and all that. Now, with all of our uh, mapping and charting and um, computer-assisted uh, uh, devices, they, they tell you what a good beat cop would have told you years and years ago. Right. You know, this right. area, that area, there are the hot spots right there. Right. We've got to do something about it. Right. Because it doesn't just stay there, as was evidenced by the combat zone in right. Boston. They said, okay, listen, we're going to allow this to happen within this certain area, right. and we'll keep it there. And, and how well did that work out for them? Right. And the same thing with Times Square. And then you had to somebody, so it takes someone like a Rudy Giuliani or other people like that who come in and make, make these changes. Or a Paul Walsh. Or a Paul Walsh. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was equating you with Rudy Giuliani. The, uh, although some people would, would Is have that co- good or bad? Well, yeah. some people claimed you were a Republican. Yeah. Um, so, Paul, you. Let's talk about this for a second, because you talk about what a good beat cop would have known in, regarding technology. What, um, what's your recollection of technology from that era? Um, and we what were, was that in, what's the impact on the case for that? Well, with, it was sort of in the infancy. Um, uh, DNA had yet to be accepted in courtrooms. Um, 
uh, all of the other things that you see on television now, the CSI effect and things like that, didn't even exist then. Uh, let's face it, this was the mid to late 80s. Mm -hmm. No one had cell phones, um, tablets, uh, personal computers, things like that. Um, just to give you a, a quick sort of sidebar on that, um, the technology changed not just our approaches to criminal um, activity, but the criminal activity itself. We used to have what we call the, uh, the, 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 the slash and grab um, where uh, a liquor store or a convenience store, someone would just run in, grab okay. whatever they could out of the register, um, run out to the waiting car, and drive down the street. That type of crime really dried up, and I'd love mm -hmm. to take credit for it as being a hard-charging district attorney, but the big thing that stopped that was cell phones. Right. People would see someone run out of a liquor store or run out of a convenience store holding a bag or some money or something, jump into a car, drive down the street, and they were behind him. They would just call in the, um, the license plate number or the make and model. Right. Um, so technology had um, a big thing, uh, a big uh, impact on criminal justice. Um, heretofore, uh, at that time, we had never, uh, and we had a, an awful lot of, and it used to be the worst time of year for me, um, was prom week, you know, the prom weeks, okay. with motor vehicle homicides, uh, kids behind the wheel. Right. Um, and heretofore, we had never um, asked for their cell phones to look at their cell phone records. Okay. Um, and we found out that that was a very important tool to find out what was actually going on at uh, the moment of impact. Right, was right. someone distracted? Were they on the phone? Were they you know, fooling around like that? So technology in a lot of different ways has affected the criminal justice system, not just with DNA evidence, but an awful lot of things. So I hope some of the advances have been positive for us. Right. And for instance, the video cameras are ubiquitous now. You have to assume wherever you go in public, you are on camera. Yes just yes. like you and I are on camera right now. You have to just assume wherever you go, you are on camera, which was not the case in the late 1980s when these, when these women began to disappear. Right. So there was no video record. It had to go on people's recollection. Exactly. And one of the difficult things, particularly with the, as they call it, the, uh, the New Bedford Highway killings, where one of the interesting things is none of the victims were found in New Bedford. And let's go into that in a second, yeah. Um, but um, a part of the thing was this. Um, a lot of the girls were ladies of the night. Mm -hmm. They had records of prostitution. So without the benefit of video being ubiquitous, being mm -hmm. everywhere, at the convenience store, at the this, at the liquor store, at the and there was it was difficult because we didn't know when someone was missing. Mm -hmm. uh, the lifestyles led to um, uh, a type of schedule that wasn't regular. Right. No one knew if she was coming home today, tomorrow, for a week or so, or for two weeks, mm -hmm. she's been living here. So pinpointing when was the last time that someone had seen uh, this particular victim was a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. So beginning the, the genesis of, okay, when did we last see her, and let's take that as our uh, beginning point, it was very vague, was very amorphous. You didn't know when the last time was. Um, and again, the lifestyle and the drug lifestyle and things like that, um, the memories faded. Mm -hmm. Memories weren't good to begin with. Right. I thought I saw her on the corner last week, but uh, wait a minute, that couldn't have been true, uh, those types of things. So right. without that type of um, technology available to us, pinpointing the date that somebody went missing mm -hmm. um, was difficult, if not impossible, to do back Absolutely. in the, the late 80s, early 90s. Absolutely. We're, we're discussing the highway serial killer case with uh, former district attorney Paul Walsh uh, here uh, on WBSM. Paul, talk about that for a second. The FBI brought, thought anyway, the case was had a very specific detail that was of interest to them, and you, and you found it to be interesting, too. Explain that about New Bedford. And one of the interesting things, because the, the popular euphemism at the time, and I think to this day, is still the New Bedford Highway Killings. Um, and it's a little bit inaccurate in that none of the victims were found in the city of New Bedford. Indeed, the um, FBI uh, profilers found this to be significant, that in many cases the victims were deposited, if you will, uh, immediately outside of the city borders. Mm -hmm. um, I went to each one of the scenes, and literally, once you went past the sign, entering Rochester, entering Freetown, or entering um, Westport, and pulled over as soon as you possibly could, um, 
that's where many of the victims were deposited. Uh, they found that to be significant, that it seemed to them to be a conscious effort not to have any body dropped off within the confines of the city of New Bedford proper. Mm -hmm. And they thought there was some significance to that. Right. They couldn't pinpoint why or, or what the reason were, but just that... Because I was a kid growing up in Freetown, and they were dumping some of the bodies in Freetown. And you're 100% right about that. As you said, you went to the scenes. They were right over the New Bedford line. Right. They dropped them, in, they dropped them on 140, but they were in Freetown. Yes. They, were not, uh, they weren't in New Bedford. No. Um, and if you did drive, as we did, we drove the route, um, it would be the nearest possible place that you could find a clear area to pull the car over, look around, go off into the woods a little bit. Um, so there seemed to be some significance to that, that. As soon as you got past that sign that said entering whatever city or town it was, um, this is where some of the victims' bodies were deposited. Uh, so some significance to that. It, exactly what it is, I'm not sure. Right. But people had their theories. Sure. Um, I always... I did tell the story. It's, it's funny, but it's, it's not funny overall. I went to basic training in Alabama with the Army in 1990. Of course, the case was very much in the news in 1990. And we were going on our first night maneuvers. And, uh, of course, there's no internet in 1990. And I'm in Alabama. And the drill sergeant, we're leaving. It's nighttime. We're marching. There's out. internet in Alabama now, though, isn't there? Not yet, actually. <laughs> there is still no internet in Alabama. But we're going off into the woods, and the drill sergeant says, yells, you know, Hey, McCarthy, if we find any dead hookers, we're going to know it's you. Right? And I went, what the, how the hell does this guy know about, you know, obviously that I was not a suspect in the case. I, yeah. Well, I don't know if I was, actually, Paul. You could. Can't tell you that, Chris. Right. Um, but the, uh, I'm thinking, how does this man know? And, of course, the guys later, you can't say anything. You know, it's the Army. And we're, we're kids. And later on, they're going, hey, why did that drill sergeant say if there's dead hookers, we're going to know it's you, you know? And you can, I can't ask him, hey, drill sergeant, how do you know if there's dead hookers? You're going to think it's me. And it was months before I found out that he happened to been roommates with a guy in the army in his first unit who was from New Bedford and had told him about the killer case. And, and But the thing was, when the guy said, I got a kid from Freetown in my unit, he went, oh, that's where they're dumping all the bodies. In other words, it wasn't, you know, Freetown became known as the place that they were. Yes. You know, they were dumping yeah. the bodies. Yep. Um, no, it's quite a, it's quite interesting. What we'll do, we'll take a quick break. Paul, when we come back, I want to talk about you become district attorney and there's the case in front of you. We'll take a quick break and we'll be back. Okay. I'm Chris McCarthy. This is WBSM. We have in studio with us um, live uh, former district attorney Paul Walsh, and we're discussing the highway serial killer case uh, from his, the time he was in the district attorney in Bristol County. So, Paul, you, the highway killing have started. The case is in progress. Paul, Ron Peener is the district attorney at the time, but not, not going to be the district attorney much longer. You decide to run for district attorney. What, what were some of your motivations to, to run for that job? Well, uh, there were a lot of different motivations, and it wasn't singly the handling of the uh, serial killing case. Um, I had been an assistant district attorney in Boston, loved the job, thought it was great. As I said, and Maureen Boyle quoted this in her book, that is a, an old quotation that's um, a Russian quotation that says, it's a poor soldier who doesn't want to be a general. Right. Well, I was an assistant district attorney. I loved the job. I thought it would be great to be the district attorney. So I kept my eye on that, and during those days, that time period, Ron Pina was quite popular. Um, he had never lost an election. He had been a state rep, uh, district attorney for a long time, and looked to be casting his eye on other higher office. Right. So uh, with a few of my friends, I said, listen, when he goes, I want to be the first one to jump out and get ready. Mm -hmm. Let's get some money lined up. Let's get organized, this and that. Um, and also, I thought I could do a better job. I saw the way things had, had run. Um, uh, again, the, one of the differences between me and, uh, and Mr. Pina was that I had been an assistant district attorney. I had tried hundreds of cases. I did see how the district court system worked. So I thought, you know, here's an opportunity. I think I could bring something to the table that we haven't had. Um, so with that, I started looking at that potentiality. Um, the highway killing case was then starting to drag him down spending an awful lot of time on it without any result. Uh, and one of the things that struck me was that I just don't think that um, publicity is good for any criminal case, whether it be a trial or, or an investigation or, or, or anything. Um, there's a, I know this is a little heavy for a Sunday morning, but um, there's, a, um, there's a phenomenon. It's known as the Heisenberg effect, and it's applied to subatomic nuclear particles. But it stands for this, that measuring the phenomenon, 
scrutinizing the phenomenon changes the phenomenon. Just like when you turn a light on and the cockroaches dive into all the little corners. Right. Well, I think when you put media attention on things that happen in the criminal justice, if people act differently. Um, right. I think the O.J. Simpson case was a perfect example of that. Uh, everybody was going crazy out there and giving news conferences and the judge and magazine with his shirt off and things like that. Right. Just um, so when you, when you bring that type of thing, people act differently, and it's never good for a criminal investigation. So I saw this happening, and I thought, geez, I wouldn't run it that way. What you're saying is it because, just so people understand at home, the, the case began to be tried in the media. It was huge. It, it, the... the um, the publicity was just, I thought, uh, way beyond what it should be. These things should be done carefully and quietly because, let's face it, suspects watch the news as well. Right. So um, I, I thought that was overplayed um, and to the detriment of an investigation. But that being said, and I don't want to be too critical of Mr. Pina because uh, uh, we've, had, we've had a separate piece. Um, but even had he done it, say, the way I might have done that, there's no guarantee that you would still catch the perpetrator of that. 90% right. of serial killings across the world uh, are, remain unsolved. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole thing there is motive. Right. Um, so even if he had uh, perhaps done it differently, um, I can't guarantee that there would have been a different result. Right. But I did see it not being run the way I would have run it and thought this was wrong. I ought to get my oar in the water here. Mm -hmm. um, so that gave me some motivation. Um, he had other difficulties. He was in front of that camera all the time instead of doing the things that I might think a district attorney would do. So with that, it gave me a little bit more um, motivation. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, um, I took a look at his financial. Uh, we, uh, again, we were talking to the days before computers right. and all that. I had to drive to Boston and pay $10 to uh, a fee to look at the, um, the records of his campaign. He didn't have much money in the bank. So I said, you know what, whether he runs or not, I think I'm going to get into the race. There's a great scene, in, because we, we, the impetus for this conversation is that Maureen Boyle has written a book, a uh, great book, Shallow Graves, on the highway killing. And she has a great scene in the book where you, where you go to Boston and then you're coming home. Right. Uh, and, you, and you've made the decision because of the money. Yes, I, I, I had to go up, pay your money to look at it, and I thought he'd have, you know, some, he'd been in for quite a long time and never lost an election. Uh, instead of having fifty dollars or $100,000 in his campaign account, he had like $5,000. So, and this is how far back we go, because going down Route uh, 24, there was still one of the old Howard Johnsons. Yep. And it was a payphone. Uh, and I got on the payphone. I called my brother Bill and said, "Hey, he's got no money. I'm in. I'm, I'm getting in." And he said, "Just, just cool your jets. Drive right. home. Uh, let's talk to Dad right. uh, and, and see how we go with this." But I, I was, I was ready to go at that point. And and from there, it, it kind of took off. I think that was the same payphone Whitey Bulger used to use. Uh, well, I don't know. I believe there's been. some surveillance photos it's of Whitey Bulger using that same <laughs> phone at Howard Johnson's. But anyway, yes. uh, there's no connection there. We. I hope not. <laughs> no. Well, he. Uh, Okay, so now you get into the race. How much, do, in your estimation now, looking back, was your victory based on the highway killing case? None at all? A little bit? A lot? What's your thoughts? Um, it's, uh, it's tough to I, say, I, I know. Yeah, but. it is tough to say. I, I think there was a tipping point. I don't think any one particular issue... Um, was that tipping point? I, I think just the, the critical mass was reached. He had, his wife had some problems that were yes. uh, well documented and, and all that. Um, he had had some other cases, uh, the Mary Ellen, Mary Ann Capute case out of Taunton, uh, which didn't go well for him. It was a nurse that was tried for a, a homicide when it was called a mercy killing. Uh, she was found not guilty and the Taunton community was very upset. Um, that they felt that their community hospital had been denigrated by the DA by okay. you know going after that. So um, the people in Taunton were upset with that. Um, even with that, there was still a residual um, from the Big Dan's case. Right. Um, th that was still in the background there. So if you went out and you talked to different people, they had different reasons. But I think once you put uh, the highway killings, the Capute case, the Big Dan's case, the fact that he'd been in for some period of time uh, and constantly on the news media um, without result, um, I think developed some critical mass. At some point, people said, you know what, let's, let's see this other guy and see what he's got to say. Didn't help him either that the Irish guy running against him could speak Portuguese. Well, it, it helped a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I kept challenging to debate me in Portuguese, but... Um, uh, 
but I, I also, with that, um, I mean, he had his difficulties, but we worked pretty hard at this. We raised yeah. a lot of money. Oh, yeah. We were out there, and it was a full court press. Um, and while he was doing other things, whether it was the grand jury or the news media, uh, I was out talking to people. I had a goal that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I would shake 500 hands. You told me that when I ran. Yeah, <laughs> and on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'd shake 1,000 hands. Right. I mean, I lived up on a Christian Avenue, and I would just stop at the Portuguese uh, restaurants and shake hands with people. Right. Um, and until I made my 1,000, I wouldn't go home. Right. So, and, um, and it also it also was nice that you had your dad, one of the most powerful political operatives in uh in Massachusetts but at the time I, in your corner. Everything that could I could possibly use to advantage. Yeah. Uh, I remember I was over in Swansea, and um, I was introduced uh, as one of the greatest basketball players ever to come out of uh, Holy Family High School, and the two foul shots that I made at Boston Garden to win the Tech Tourney. Um, of course, that was my brother who had done that. <laughs> <laughs> but who was I to embarrass the person that was uh, introducing me? Right, so right, right. I just let that go. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so you win the election. Boom. Now you're the district attorney. Now, as, as I've mentioned before, God doesn't come down with a staff and put it on your forehead and divine all the information of the world to you. You're, the, the Democrat Party put you in charge of the district attorney's office. The voters did after that. What's day one? Uh, well, there was so much uh, to be done. There was organizational um, issues with the office. Um, we had that case pending, which was the one that was getting the most attention from the media. Um, but in order to run a proper investigation, you had to have the proper things in order. Um, so it was, it was daunting at first, but I recognized that given the level of scrutiny that the highway killings had, it had to be priority one. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were two main investigators, um, uh, Josie Gonzalez and Marianne Dill, uh, along with the head of the CPAC unit, the Crime Prevention and Control Unit, which is at that time about 20 state police detectives okay. assigned to homicide cases and um, interjurisdictional drug cases. Uh, so I met with them. We met three times a week from 9 o'clock in the morning until noontime. And we went through every suspect, every issue, everything that was out there. We brought in others. Uh, Detective Richie Ferreira from New Bedford was a, a wealth of information. Um, and we brought in other individuals who had been involved. And we went through everything for, oh, I'm going to say two months. Okay. Um, and just so that I had uh, a universe of knowledge that I felt comfortable with, right. that nobody would know more about this case than I would, right. other than Marianne and Josie. Uh, and they were, they were just, uh, the work that they did was, um, that should be a book in itself. Um, so that was the thing, get to this body of knowledge mm -hmm. um, so that now you can move to decision making. Okay. okay, we think we know all the facts there are to know. Um, now what do we do? And, and that was the, the sit down and say, okay, now it's decision time. What do you think? And I've always been one for participatory management. And I would ask Josie, I would ask Mary Ann, I would ask Detective uh, McCarthy um, and other lawyers in the office, well, what should we do? Well, what do you think now? Okay. Um, and I think uh, I, I got some, I was fortunate to have some very good advice. Because until you became the district attorney, you weren't privy to any any more information than anybody else, just the fact that you were running for the job. So now you sit down and you begin this laborious activity where you're just going over every single detail. And the reason was because Pont has, has already been charged. Ken Pont has been charged by Ron Peter, and the case is, is pending. He's been charged with one of the homicides, but he's also been just labeled basically the killer by the media, right? Is that yes. an, an accurate? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think that was it. Um, but even early on, even from... Um, from outside of the DA's office, um, the, the indictment there seemed to be logically inconsistent. One of the difficulties with a serial killer is that there is no motive, and that's why they're so difficult to, um, to apprehend. Mm -hmm. in, in criminal justice, when you do an investigation, we have the three things. We call it mom. Motive, opportunity, and means. Okay. Um, but the biggest of those is usually motive. Why did the person do that? And if you can figure out the why, whether it's the jealous boyfriend or the bank robber for the money or the whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, y that's usually your starting point. We, and in serial killings, you don't have that. So um, with that as a basis, um, it was difficult to establish anything. 
Now, with Pont, there seemed to be a suggestion that, I believe it was the Dope Urala woman, um, that there was a motive. Okay. That she was going to testify against him in a gun case where he had threatened someone, I believe, down in the Weld Square area. Um, so having a motive and being a serial killer seemed to me to be logically inconsistent. If that were the case, if that were the motive, mm -hmm. and if it were actual, then why would he kill seven, eight, or nine others. It just didn't seem to make any right, sense. Right. So, um, so that disconnect was a little bit um, disconcerting. In someone. other words, because there was an actual understanding, uh, a motive that you understood and was logical for one Achilles, it, it, uh, it ruled out, in some respects anyway, that he would have been doing these other activities because it's not logical. There would have to be eight other motivators. Right. Or, or just have the wrong person. Uh, because, again, on serial killings, the, the motivation is usually some psychological thing, some, right. some crazy that you, you, nobody knows about, whether right. it's Son of Sam, uh, uh, you know, Berkowitz, or, or, or down in Florida, who was the, the good-looking guy down there that killed the, um, the young co-eds. Um, Bundy. Bundy, yes. Um, some other motive other than something personal to them. Right. Like in this case, it was, you're going to testify against me. Uh, I'll lose my license to practice law. I could go to jail or this right. and that, the other. Right. So it didn't seem to be logically consistent that a motive on one individual would lead to the murder of seven or eight others. It just didn't yeah. make sense. Uh, now, however, you've got a high profile. It's a national story. It's, yes. a na it's an international story. It's high profile. You're the new district attorney. You're just coming in. You've defeated this guy. This is in some case, ways uh, Ron Pina's baby, and, 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 you know, that this case and that he's he's... He's attempting to basically say he solved it, possibly, and you're faced with what is um, the, rea the political reality that, that if you just blow this case out of the water, uh, that, that it's going to look political, it's going to look wrong, it's going to be an outcry. However, you also say to yourself, looks like we, we have a miscarriage of justice here, possibly. So you're faced with having to handle this, and how do you handle it, Paul? What, what, what's your decision within your office of what do we do with this case? Um first thing is get good advice. And, and I spoke to all types of individuals, whether they be um, uh, from the police side, from the prosecution side, from the defense side, uh, and, and other smart people. Um, and it came down to this. Listen, I think we had pretty good consensus on what should be done. Mm -hmm. uh, Pont didn't do this. He's, it doesn't seem to make any sense. It seems to be unprovable mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just the logic you know, to stand in front of a jury, I can't imagine what my argument would have been okay. to them to say why he had done this uh, and what evidence we would have had other than the words of others who might have been unreliable. Um, so that case had to go away. Um, he didn't do, I don't believe he did what he was charged with. Um, there was no evidence to support it, and it was logically inconsistent. But as you've just alluded to, there was the political aspect. Oh, well, this is Walsh's get back to right. Pina. Okay, just you know, take care of that. So um, good advice from others. And they said, listen, why don't you bring in a special prosecutor? Okay. Um, someone that you know, that you trust, that's got the, uh, the backbone and, uh, and the wherewithal to handle something like that. So a few names were floated to me, but one that I, I hit on was Paul Buckley. Now, Paul Buckley was an attorney that I had met in Boston. He was the former first assistant in Suffolk County. Uh, he'd been a prosecutor. He'd been a defense attorney. Uh, he had a very good way about him. He was not just smart, but he was wise. Um, and so it was an individual that you could sit down with and talk to. And he also handled cases of that nature, big cases, publicity cases. Mm -hmm. So I met with him and said, listen, this is what we're faced with. This is what I need um, uh, to happen, that somebody take an independent view of this. Okay. So it takes away all the politics. Right. He was glad to do it, and I was so fortunate um, that he was able to help us in that circumstance. And so he went in and reviewed the case, and he ultimately re recommended to you Yes. Um, he, he met with uh, Josie and Marianne. They were up to his office all the time, went through all the documents. Again, this guy's a pro. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a rookie. I, I, I have to admit that. I oh, was cool. a rookie. And, um, and I, needed, I needed a pro in there that had been around the block uh, more than a few times. And he came to the same conclusion I did, okay. uh, that Punt didn't do it. We, first of all, let's get rid of that before we can... Uh, one of the things that happens in a criminal investigation is you can get blinders. Okay. By looking at one individual, that um, prohibits you from looking at other potential. Sure. sure. Um, so he said, first thing we have to do is take a look at the Punt case. And I said, this is, these are your decisions. You're independent. You can do what you want, but let's keep in touch. And he did. 
Okay. So ultimately, you dismissed the charges against yeah against Pond. There wasn't enough evidence. There wasn't a. Uh, there was no way to stand in front of a jury and argue that he had done this. Right. So the, now the case is back. Now you've got the case. It pawns out. Um, keeping in mind that there are certain, because it's still an open investigation, we, you know, we're going to obviously respect that, and, and, and you're going to answer questions as you, as you feel comfortable answering them, given that it is still an open investigation. What was your next move? Um, do what you normally do. Take, take the spotlight off of it. Stop talking to the media. Sorry, Chris, and uh, <laughs> uh, others from the media uh, that are represented. Um, and just do your, your legwork. Do your groundwork. Do it quietly. Do it professionally. Josie Gonzalez and Marianne Dill were ultimate professionals. Uh, let them do their work. Um, and again, knowing that these are difficult cases to prove. Um, as I, I spoke to you off the record uh, the other day, but 90% um, of serial killings um, are unsolved. Mm -hmm. And another interesting fact, having read through all the literature and doing this quite uh, voluminous reading on the subject. I, another odd thing is that 90% of them occur in the United States. Amazing. That, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you find out these, these things. But anyway, a criminal investigation should be done a certain way. You start with A, you go to B, you go to C. Uh, you do it quietly and you do it professionally, and that's what we started to do all over again. Now, you, of course, start to learn about this case Talk to me a little bit, if you're comfortable with it, about a lot of names start surfacing, right? Yes. People who weren't who weren't the killer, probably, because. But what was your reaction? When you start to see all kinds of names coming up about people who were involved in this sex drugs underworld, um, that was that was challenging uh, because there was a tip line and. And tip lines, I don't know if I'm a fan of them anymore. Uh, you can get the crazies out there that just say, oh, my next door neighbor who they've hated because he doesn't rake his leaves or something. Right. Um, he's a killer. Uh, those types of things. But you have to chase them down. Once you open up tip light, you've got to run down. So that can be distracting. Um, I don't know that we got anything useful out of that, but it was something that we had to chase down. And as I kept saying with a sports analogy, run out the ground balls. You'd never know which one is going to be, particularly in something like this. So names kept popping up all over the place. Right. Um, and in that universe, down in Weld Square, and, and also down there is Gundadinho and those places uh, down the south end, um, the names were well known to the police officers, to the people that were hanging out. Uh, uh, Josie Gonzalez and Miriam Dill, they knew everybody. They mm -hmm. knew their families. They knew where they lived. When they didn't go home, they knew where they stayed. Right. Um, so there were names out there. Uh, and I remember, I know it sounded corny, but when the media would ask me, do you have a suspect? I said, the world is a suspect. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know who it could be. It could be anybody, because again, motive seems to be out the window. There's a scene in uh, um, Shallow Graves by Maureen Boyle where it's prior to you taking over as a district attorney, but um, Bob St. Jean, who's a state police officer who's attached to the district attorney's office under Ron Pina, he starts getting phone calls from prominent people. Who, who are wondering why they're being called by the police regarding this case, and, and, they're, and, and they're worried because, in fact, there were prominent people who were utilizing some of the uh, the services of these of these victims, right? Correct. Yes. Yep. Um, so uh, you know they would call. Hey, is my name being bounced around for this or that? Uh, they probably weren't killers. So no, they, I don't think they were. But they were concerned about their reputations or their name being out there. So that was another part of the distraction. Right. Um, but then you had to look at them as well because sure. now there is a motive. Um, would you kill someone um, to keep your name out of the newspaper? Right. Um, but then take that and go, would you kill eight people or nine people or ten people? Uh, that was the leap that I thought was made in the Pond case that perhaps should not have been made. Um, of course, you're a district attorney. You just take over. You've got – this isn't the only case in the office, right? Right. So I can talk for a second about the resources that went into this case and uh, – because it couldn't you – know, while it was the media's big case, that's not your – wasn't your only priority, right? Um, I've always, uh, I've always lived by this, at least in my career as a prosecutor. That when you say that, um, I, I've avoided this. That, and I've heard others say it, and it just it makes me cringe. That this is the most important case in the office. Um, I've avoided that because I don't think you should be saying that. 
because you know what? There's other homicides. There are other homicides that are pending. Mm -hmm. And there are families at home who have a victim. That's someone, their sister, right. their brother, their mother uh, has been murdered. And to say that this other case is a higher priority than that case, I just don't think is fair. Right. Um, some measure of justice have to, has to be consistency and fairness. So to say this is the most important case, I think, is, is denigrates the other cases mm -hmm. that are pending. Right. So you have to, um, you have to be even-handed. Uh, and it's difficult with um, finite resources. You have to put an awful lot into this, um, not just because it's high profile, but um, it's it's significant. Sure. Uh, you've got you know uh, uh, eight or nine um, young ladies out there, um, but. So that was trying to have some balance uh, was important and it was daunting trying to get yourself organized. Um, I, I don't. This was just a, a little sideline, but uh, right as I was being sworn in, uh, a bus was driving from New Bedford down to Cape Cod, and two guys were in the woods just pot shotting trees. I remember that. And they just looked out onto the highway and they saw this great big target, this big gold orange yellowish target go by and they took a pot shot which happened to be a school bus right now that bus going at 60 miles an hour would have been in my jurisdiction about 45 seconds earlier right we weren't set up yet with our telecommunications with our um, response lines with our protocols so mm -hmm. who's the first call who's the second call what do we get a team out there right so these were all daunting challenges that i had to start with right um there was a little girl who was killed on that bus. Yes, Just she was killed yeah. in that, that. That was a Plymouth County case, right. only by the, the stretch of highway and right. the 45 seconds that it took to go over the, the county line. Right. Um, so these were daunting challenges, which uh, I was a sole practitioner. I'm running an office now with 60 lawyers, right. 20 detectives, uh, another 40 uh, on staff, um, and putting that all together uh, w was daunting. It was challenging. Uh, so Now, Ponce out, or at least out of the charges. Did, did, where, where did the office focus next? Again, I know we, we can't save names and things like this. You got, you're limited here on some things. But where did the office go from there? Uh, you, well, what, what I did with um, Josie Gonzalez and Marianne Dill was we went through every single potential, even as remote as they could possibly be. Okay. We looked at truck drivers that might have come through this area. We looked at um, other transients. Uh, we looked at... Coast Guard personnel, mm -hmm. people like that, assigned here in the military that have been in for a, a little while and then gone. Um, so we went through all of those types of transient people because uh, Weld Square was, you know, off of a couple of highways and right. uh, all, you know, its, it's geographic location um, lent itself maybe to some transients. Mm -hmm. um, so we looked through all of that. Then we looked through the locals and the reputations, who's violent, who isn't, who's this. Um, and then said, okay, this is our sort of roster of mm -hmm. potential suspects. And now let's score them. Well, what do we think of this one? What do we think of that one? Is this a potential? Is that a potential? Okay. Um, and then once we set up somewhat of a priority, let's say, okay, so what evidence do we have? Not just what we believe, but what evidence do we have? Right. And that was the difficult thing. We found skeletal remains. We didn't find much in the way of tissue. We didn't find much in the way of DNA. We didn't find much in the way of, um, I mean, we found some things uh, which, which were helpful. And I hope someday that there's some technology that might, break something and mm -hmm. tell us uh, who had done this. But um, we just went out uh, at it the way you should go at a criminal uh, case. Just do your job and let's see what happens. And, of course, I, I think we have to keep going back to this because, as you pointed out, we're, we're so conditioned now because of the television programs and because of modern technology and what we see in the media about cases being solved. And, of course, everything's solved, you know, right before the commercial break anyway at the hour or the half hour. So... You have none of those benefits, really, of technology. No, no, we didn't. Uh, DNA was in its infancy. Um, but even with that, um, skeletal remains yield very little uh, when it comes to DNA. Um, so things like that, that um, were just, uh, with the passage of time, we, uh, prosecutors uh, refer to it somewhat ruefully uh, as the CSI effect, uh, that jurors want um, they want those cases. They say, well, why didn't you do DNA on this within 24 hours? It, it takes nine months to get a good DNA sample, unless you, of course, can prioritize it. Um, fingerprints and this and all those things that you see on the television shows that happen within an hour and, as you say, solve the crime and you have prosecutors getting confessions from defendants. I mean, that stuff is, is for television. Right. Um, but, but the people that watch that uh, also form the populace from which you you choose your jurors, your grand jurors. Right. Um, so the expect expectation level can get quite high. Well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? 
Well, those things weren't available to us. Okay. Um, and even if they were available, given the state of the evidence that we had, it might not have been availing anyway. Right, right. Do you, do you, um, do you think the case is one of these unsolved but uncharged that we hear sometimes? Is that, do, you, do you feel that some of the investigators uh, feel that they were pretty comfortable with who they think it was, even though they were unable to, to charge the person? Yes. Yeah, I, I think there are individuals out there that say, I, I think I know, uh, I'm pretty confident that it was X or Y. Um, and you're talking about knowledgeable people who are investigators on the case. Yes, yeah. Um, and, uh, but again, you need evidence. Uh, that's the, uh, the there's, no, there's no substitute. You can't go on a whim. You can't go on, I think, this because of that. Again, uh, television, you, you see these things that, well, they get into the psychological aspect of it, which is total BS, if you ask me. They say, well, if he thought this, then he must have done that, and if he must have done that, then he would have done this, and she would have reacted that way. Right. It's all conjecture. Right. Uh, um, you know, I, I have always thought that we have to be very careful in a criminal investigation like this not to apply rational thought to irrational conduct. Um, so if you have someone that say, well, the logic would indicate this, but these are people that aren't operating logically. A serial killer is not logical. It's not logical. Right. So, so that, that helps, that, that, that defeats the, um, uh, the mom, the motive, opportunity, and means. It, mm -hmm. it takes the motive out of it. Um, and it also takes the rational thought out of it. So it's hard to, to guess or to conjecture and say, well, if this happened, then the next step should have been this. You can't say that with a crime of this type because logic doesn't dictate. We're talking with former district attorney of Bristol County, uh, Paul Walsh Jr. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to ask Paul uh, if he thinks the suspect is, is still alive. But we'll, we'll be back here in a moment. And good morning, or what's left of it. I'm Chris McCarthy. This is Sunday Brunch. We have Paul Walsh uh, here in the office, in the studio, the former district attorney of Bristol County, discussing the highway serial killer case. Paul, before I I went, you, uh, we were discussing the fact that um, some of the knowledgeable investigators in the case do have an opinion on this and feel like they know who solved the case. Um, do you feel as if uh, any, the man, man or woman who did this is still alive today? Um, my own personal opinion is no. Okay. Uh, again, I've done an awful lot of reading, not just on this particular case, on the investigative reports, um, but on reports... Uh, from across the country, uh, you know, whether you get to the Berkowitz or the Bundys or this, and they had to read all of that, the Green River uh, case out in uh, the Northwest. Um, serial killers don't stop. They don't wake up one day and say, okay, I've had enough of this murder rampage. Uh, I'm just going to stop and go back to work. Okay. Um, something stops them. Right. Either they get caught or they die. All right. um, those killings have stopped. Right. So um, I think logic might indicate or be at least a little bit persuasive that the person's no longer with us, mm -hmm. either in jail somewhere okay. out in Kansas or, or they've died. Right. Um, but the, uh, the killings in this area have stopped. So, Do you think there's any connection to these? So we had a serial killer here. That's clear. Do you think there's any connection between the killings that were done here and, and killings that were done in other parts of the country or the world? We've uh, been exhaustive. Uh, we were down to Connecticut. We were out to Portugal. We were in various areas that had um, prostitution areas, and girls would go missing. Um, prostitutes are the most victimized class of people in our society. Okay. So, um, so it's hard to know when you have a pattern. Um, girls go missing. Girls are, are beaten, robbed, raped um, at a greater uh, number than any other people in our society. Um, so to keep your, uh, your antennae uh, out there and know is that does this match up, you have to look at everything. Right. And we continue to do that. And sometimes you found similarities, but you would. I mean, there's prostitution, there's drugs, right. there's um, a lifestyle that doesn't lend itself to uh, coming and going and uh, certain schedules and when is she missing and uh, those types of things. So those would all be similar to what we had in, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. So, but you have to keep looking at it, run right. out the ground balls. You owe it to the victim's families. So we've been, we've been discussing the case with Paul. I always thought uh, 
at the same time the serial killer case was going on, they made that movie Pretty Woman about how great it was to be a prostitute, right? How your life would be to turn turn great. And, and the reality of it is, is they're, they're turning up prostitutes all over the highways of uh, Massachusetts uh, who have been victimized, robbed, raped, as you said, and then ultimately murdered. Yet you have Hollywood saying what a great what a great lifestyle it is. This is this is Sunday brunch. I'm Chris McCarthy. We're gonna have the national news and the local news coming up, and then. Um, We'll take some phone calls on okay. this in the next in the next hour. Uh, if you'd like to join us, you can at 508-996-0500. Get on the line. Uh, you can uh, ask uh, Paul Walsh uh, any questions you have. You can't maybe answer all of them because of uh, the case is still open. But if you're interested, 508-996-0500.